Thence, remember what thence means. Thence was where the lady who came and she wanted her daughter healed. And Jesus said, hey man, you're just one of the puppies. You don't even belong to Israel, man. You're a dog. All my people call you the dog. They call you the junkyard dog, the nasty varmint with a bunch of mange and fleas. Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to call you a little puppy dog. Don't you even know that I came to Israel? And she called him, oh man, son of David. You're the chosen one. You're the Messiah. She knew Israeli teaching. She was up in the Gentile land. This is the only time Jesus stepped outside of Israel to do some ministering, and it was up there in Tyre and Sidon where she was. And she believed when the Pharisees didn't believe. They would see miracles and wouldn't believe. And she believed. And she came back with a retort, Yes, Lord, but even the puppies get to eat the crumbs that fall off the master's table. And Jesus is like, This chick ain't going to give up, man. I love her faith. I love her faith, man. He said, be it so. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And Jesus departed from that place, and he came nigh to the Sea of Galilee, and he went up to a mountain, and he sat there. And great multitudes came to him, like always, having with them those that were lame, blind, they couldn't speak, they were broke down, maimed up, and others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. They said, Jesus, we brought this <laughs> maimed guy to you. Bloop. And cast him down at Jesus' feet. And Jesus healed him. You see, there's only healing at the feet of Jesus. That means I have to be humble and go lower. If I'm going to find healing, if I'm going to find blessing, if I'm going to find victory, I have to go lower. I have to get down there around the hem of his garment, around his feet, and humble myself And as a servant, as a slave. Let him know my petition. Let him know my request because he's so good and he wants to hear it. He understands that he's king of kings. And true kings, if, if we had a king in our country who came and walked in today... It's only right to do obeisance to that king. Jesus is the king of all kings. He's the king to whom all kings bow and do their obeisance. Wouldn't we not surely bow at his feet and do obeisance to him? And that separates us from whether we are walking in Jesus or not. Great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed. They, they had so many diseases and problems with them. They cast them at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch that the multitude, they were wondering when they saw that the dumb could speak. Remember, we mentioned that before. What was so amazing, they saw miracles in their past, but they never saw a dumb man receive back his speech. Because they always knew that it was demons of infirmity and demons who would cause these ailments. And they would always ask the demon, what is your name? And the demon had to tell them who they were and tell them what gateway they entered. But the dumb man never could do that, so dumb men couldn't be healed. They had to remain dumb. But Jesus, they came along and Jesus didn't have to ask the demons. He knew what was in man and he knows what's in demons. And he cast those devils out and the people spoke. And that's why these people were so amazed and they wondered. It says, uh, and so much that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb speaking, the maimed to behold, the lame walking, and the blind being able to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. Now you've got to understand that we are in a Gentile area. The Gentiles are worshipping the God of Israel and the Israelites are not. They are worshipping a God they invented who they call the God of Israel. And these people really worshipped when they saw Jesus in action. Verse 32. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, Hey, I have compassion on the multitude. Aren't you thankful that he has compassion on you? Aren't you thankful that he's always caring for you and there's not one little need that's too little for him? Every need that you have is big to him. That's what the word compassion means. He has compassion on you and his compassions fail not. Aren't you thankful that he never fails in his compassion for you? He loves you. He cares for your every little need, every whim, every little thing that comes along. It's not too small. He wants to hear you discuss it with him. Lord, I'm having an issue. I'm having an issue with my family. I'm having family issues. I'm having an issue with my work. I'm having an issue here, Lord, of my finances. I need to be able to pay the bill this month. The Lord wants to hear you speak because he has compassion. He has compassion if you don't speak. He's just not going to do what he needs to do because you haven't asked. You have not because you ask not. 
He wants you to ask. He wants you to share. He wants you to know that he's compassionate toward you, and you can share everything with him. He's your best friend. He's the dearest one. He's the lover of your soul. He's good. This world, there's nothing good in this world, but in Jesus, it's all good. It's all good. You're saying, hey, it's all God when you say that, because only God is good. Jesus cares for your soul. And he says, he has compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now these three days. They've been there for three days, having a three-day thing with Jesus healing, a three-day healing service, folks. Casting out devils, giving sight to the blind, healing up people that are, have no reason to be healed. And they could have been healed in the past, but this Jesus guy comes along and does miracles that nobody else can do. He does good things, good acts that nobody else can keep up with because it's about Jesus. And he does it all in compassion. Not, hey, look at me, Africa Pocus. It's, hey, dude, I got compassion. I want to heal you. I want to help you. And he says, they, they, people have been with me for three days. They have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away starving. Now, guys, this is very important. David said, I've never seen the children of God forsaken or his seed begging for bread. When it seems like there's no bread coming in, there's no morsels coming in, there's no fish coming in, there's, there's no sustenance, you've got to stick around. Stick around and understand that Jesus is a God of compassion and He wants to bless you. He wants to keep you, keep you fed. He may have you not eat for three or four days, but He's coming through with it. And it's very important in the days ahead, especially in the tribulation time when there's famine and pestilence and you, you can't buy or sell or trade without the mark. Jesus will still feed you if you'll trust in Him. Do not get that mark. Trust in the Lord. He will feed you. He has compassion on you even after you have put a fist in his face and you failed at the rapture. You didn't get a go in the rapture. God will immediately wake a bunch of people up who knew the truth if they survived the hailstorm that's coming, the earthquake, the convulsions, the stones coming out of, out of heaven. If they survived that and we're praying that our town will. We have a group of people who pray and fast every day of the week, 24 hours a day. What we're praying is, Lord, save our town. Get our preachers to hearing the truth, understanding what's going on. Open their eyes. Open the elders' eyes. Open the prayer warriors' eyes. Have a sea in our town of Jonesboro. And have a sea up in Paragould and Truman and Lake City. Lord, it's these counties. We want Craighead. We want Green County saved and delivered. And when the trouble comes, will you please let the land still be standing when all the world's being destroyed, when the world around us is being wiped out, and when that... Uh, Earthquake fault line has destroyed everything in its wake. Will you preserve our towns, Lord? Will you please preserve our town? And we're fasting not only for today, but we're fasting for the future. Because we want people saved today, and we want people who said, I don't need salvation today, who will wake up one day and realize it's too late for them to be saved in an earlier episode, but they can be saved now because Jesus is full of compassion. And even in his wrath, he will remember his mercy. And that's what we're praying in our fast, Lord, in your wrath. Remember mercy. Please remember mercy. Be merciful to these people. Let them live to hear you one more day and to choose you. And he says, I'm not going to send them away starving, lest they, on their way home, they just fall out and they can't keep up. And his disciples said unto him, where in the world are we going to get this much bread in the wilderness to feed a multitude? They forgot about the previous miracle. Remember when he fed 5,000 men and the women and children. And they brought a little boy and he had... Biscuits there and fish sandwiches, and he gave it to the Lord, and the Lord fed everybody, and at the end they had 12 baskets of fragments left over. And God's so cool, he didn't just leave it on the ground, because he doesn't like waste. Meanwhile, all over the world, people are needing clean water, and we're dumping it on our heads wasteful, because we are Americans, and that's what we do. We are materialists. We take every blessing of God and just dump it on the ground for our pleasure, for our fun, and don't even see that the drought line is moving in from California. All of California is under a drought right now. Texas is under a drought right now. All the water is being removed. And this whole baptism is a baptism of drought. It's a baptism of catastrophic events proportionally brought by water. Could be ice, in whatever form water's in. Could be steam. Could be cold water in a wintertime event. Whatever way, it's a curse has been placed on people, and the numbers say so in the supercomputer. Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves do you guys have at this time? You forgot what happened last time. How many loaves have we discovered? And they said, We have seven and a few fish. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and he gave thanks. That's God again. 
Remember, he takes what's been given to him and he thanks the Lord for it because in everything we give thanks. And he took a little and he offered it to the Lord knowing that the Father can make a lot out of a little if we hand it to the Father. If we're thankful for what we have. Don't hate the day of small things. Don't hate uh, when, when it doesn't seem as big as it should be. Rejoice in what you have now. Rejoice. Give God thanks. Give Him praise and pray Him to bless it. Ask Him to bless it. And He will. And He took the seven loaves and the fishes and He gave thanks and He broke them and He gave to His disciples and said, Guys, go, do your, go use your gifts. Go serve. Go take your spiritual gifts and go utilize them for the glory of God. And everybody who received food, they ate and they were filled, man. They stuffed to the gills. Stuffed to the gills with fish. Hmm. And they took up the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full. Now, guys, this word for basket here, it's the same basket that Paul was let down Damascus. Remember when Paul was saved, he was, he was on the road to Damascus. He was going there to kill Christians. And on the way to kill Christians, now, remember, it was on the way to Damascus where Christian, Christianity went to the Gentiles for the first time. Acts chapter 9. Paul reiterates the story in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 33. He says, man, I was in Damascus. I received the Lord, and the locals were out to kill me, man. And the word came, and so they took a big basket, a big enough for a man to fit in, and they lowered it outside the city walls, outside a window, and let him down to escape at night so he wouldn't be killed and assassinated. That's the same size of basket these guys had. Don't be thinking it was seven little baskets. It's seven baskets that took a man to carry it on this side and another man to carry it on this side. It was huge baskets full left over. That's what God can do with a little. He turns it into a lot. And last time it was 12, this time it's 7. Because God does everything with purpose. He says, and they that did eat were about 4,000 men besides the women and children. So 12,000? 4 times 3? 12,000 plus? God took these little 7 loaves and a few fishes and fed the whole crowd, and had seven massive baskets left over. And he sent the multitude away, and he took the ship, and he came over to the coast of Magdala. Now, he left the area where he was in definite Jewish or, or Gentile territory. He left there, and he came over to an area of Decapolis. Decapolis were ten cities in Israel, but they were Greekized. They were Romanized. They were not Israelized. They weren't serving the God of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were Gentiles serving false gods, and these ten cities had a league with Rome, and they were allowed to make their own money, mint their own coins. They were of Gentile persuasion. So Jesus leaves a Gentile region for sure that was not Israel, and he heads down to a Gentile region in Israel. And what we're seeing is a transition of God's ministry from Israel to the Gentiles because Israel refused when the Gentiles received and accepted God's always going to go to a people who receives him when he is present. He's present everywhere. But he's going to cut off that time, the time of the Gentiles. Right there we see the transitioning from the Jews to the Gentiles. And we're about to have the last, when the last soul, the last spirit comes from heaven. And that one has grown up and it becomes a child, it becomes an individual. And it receives, that person receives the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. They repent of their sins, they forsake, they follow him in obedience, they are into the Lord's Supper, they remember his death, they've been baptized, they're walking along with the Lord, and they're being faithful. Every little step he asks them to take, they're taking it. They're being faithful. And when that happens, the very last Gentile gets saved, boom, that's called the fullness of the Gentiles, and he's going to rapture the church. He's going to call out everybody who's believed from that time, from the time of Jesus' resurrection, from the time of Stephen, when Stephen was stoned, everybody who's died since him, all the dead in Christ will rise first, and everybody else who's a believer in him and a follower in him will be resurrected or risen up or raptured, harpazoed, will be snatched out. The dead will raise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. And that is the fullness of the Gentiles. But right here, he still includes the Gentiles. And the Pharisees also with the Sadducees, they came to Jesus and they desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. I want you to get the picture. He's up there in Tyre and Sidon. He's preaching the truth. He, a multitude go, comes to him after he's been up in a mountain, and he does great miracles. Boy, they're in awe. They can't believe what their eyes are seeing. They can't believe what they're hearing out of people they've never heard say words uh, in, in you know all their lives. And over this three-day period, we're having a revival. We're seeing big things happen. We're seeing miracles. And then Jesus has compassion in the middle of that. It was all about the show and then, hey, you guys take care of yourself. It was 
compassion and mercy and tenderness. And then it's like all the, the rest of the healthy folks are now in a place where they're not so healthy, where they're not healthy. And so let's get them some food. And he gets them food, and we know it's the same type of story, the fish and the loaves. And the fragments they take up were seven huge baskets that will fill a man going down the side of a wall in. Okay? So they take these seven baskets, and I'm sure they put them on the boat, because God is not about waste. He knows where he's going. There's probably a bunch of poor people, because all across that area was poor people. You were either rich or poor. There was no middle class. So Jesus knew where he was going was a bunch of starving people who probably needed fragments from seven baskets. So he never wasted because he didn't always want to leave this miracle here. He wanted this miracle to be a miracle elsewhere too. And when you see a miracle, it's not just for now, it's for the future. When you've received a miracle, it's for you to take that testimony of that miracle and share it with other people to bless them and create miracles in their lives. And that miracle goes on. And so there were 13 of them, 12, and Jesus. And they had to get out of the boat and so they probably had an assembly line going and get these baskets that way. And they were sending them forward, sending them forward. And then they would lift it out, sit it down on the ground. And then two disciples would go. Peter and Andrew. Grab that basket. Head over to those four people over there. So Andrew's on one side. Peter's on the other. And they're carrying their miracle. And they're going to go feed the mouths of the hungry and the starving. And they settle down. And the second basket comes. James and John. Grab that basket. Go. Second Third one comes, fourth one comes, fifth one comes, sixth one comes, seventh one comes. It's just Jesus left. Who's going to help Jesus carry that one? We don't know who helped Jesus carry that one. But we see right here that in verse 1, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees, they came tempting him, desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. Can you picture it? They just row up on the, on the shore. They start unloading their miracles because they're going to take care of the people everywhere because God does not believe in waste. Americans do. God does it. And so they're loading it, and they're all carrying their stuff off, and finally the seventh basket comes off, and it's Jesus. Meanwhile, he sees these Pharisees coming who would normally never, ever, ever help somebody do something like this. And they say, hey, Jesus, we had a question for you. And I can see Jesus saying this, hey, grab that other end. And while they're walking, Pharisees and Sadducees, they came and they said to him, hey, we want to see a miracle from you. Dude's holding a miracle. He heard about what happened, the ruckus, when they fed the 5,000, which was about 15,000 because they had to feed the wives and the children there too. These guys saw miracle after miracle after miracle. Three days ago, for the last three days, Jesus has been doing miracle on top of miracle. And he was doing it there because where he was doing it, these guys wouldn't see it. All they had was signs and miracles and wonders, but they wouldn't believe because they were just wanting to see something different. Guys, if your heart is set on you, you'll never see God. If your heart is set on the ways of your forefathers and the ways of your culture and the way it is and the way it's been in our church, you will never see God at work. You'll never experience Him. You will be blinded even when the miracles performed in front of you. You're going to say, oh, that's hocus pocus, that's illusion. You're going to make up all these wicked excuses that came out of your wicked heart. That's why God destroyed the world in the flood, because the imagination of their heart was only evil continually. And God's calling us to a place of, of faith, to believe in Him, to understand that, man, this oxygen came, it didn't develop. Guys, if evolution were true, you'd still have your monkey tail. You would. You wouldn't have lost your tail. I mean, evolution would have you keep the tail. I got a kid in this hand, I got groceries in this hand, and I need somebody to unlock that door. Right? It would have helped us. Evolution isn't real. Evolution is a lie. But if you hate God, you're going to believe the lie. If you will not see God at work, you're going to believe what the devil is telling you to believe. You're going to totally miss the miracle. You're totally going to miss the feeding, even while you're carrying the bucket. You're going to miss it. Jesus Christ doesn't want you to miss it. But if you will not humble yourself, and it all starts with God, you must believe that He exists. Start there. You, go, you know, the Bible says he's put that light in everybody. If you don't believe in God, it's because you made yourself not believe in God. That's what the Bible tells us. You need to get back to where you originally were, where you contemplated it, before you finally just threw it all out. Faith. God will increase your faith. There is a God, and you need to believe in him. Because there's a false God that doesn't want you to believe in him, and he's going to bring you to hell. And he's going to have that hook covered with such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful morsel of something. But it's whatever you like. He said the Pharisees 
came to him and the Sadducees came to him and they said, we want to see a sign while they were holding a sign. While they experienced sign after sign after sign after sign after sign. But they, well, their problem was they didn't want to believe that Jesus was the sign giver. Show us one more thing. And you evolutionists and you doubters, i got to see it for myself. i got to believe it for myself. You're going to hell with that attitude. You need to humble yourself before the hem of Jesus and say, man, I've got to understand the truth. I know that you came to save me. Will you save me? God's good, man. He's compassionate. He doesn't want you in hell. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to ask of him. He wants you to see the miracles that he's already done. Your eyes are closed to the miracles he's already done in your life. You woke up this morning, right? That's a miracle. You're still able to be mobilized? Quadriplegics have wonderful gifts of family and friends in their lives that help them move. What a gift. Instead of complaining and cursing your curse, why don't you praise God in everything give thanks? God will bring life out of your death. That's what he does for a living. He's great at it. He says, and he answered and said to them, when it's evening, you guys will say, oh man, it's going to be a great day tomorrow. And what he's getting at, let's look at verse 3 there. It says, and in the morning you'll say, oh man, the sky's red, red in the morning. Sailors take warning, man. He says, the sky's red and it's lowering. Jesus looks at him and says, oh, you stupid hypocrites. You can take something that God has placed in motion and you have totally negated the creator who put those things in motion and now you're just looking at the motion and the activities of that motion itself instead of the one who put them in motion. And you know every day that the sun's going to rise in the east and it's going to set in the west. You know that, but you do not understand and you will not look to the fact that all design demands a designer. You love the design. You know that when it's red at night, sailors take delight. When it's red in the morning, oh, sailors take your warning. But you won't understand and consider who put those things in motion to make them work the same way. Hey, the sun is going to rise in the east tomorrow. That's design. It's going to sit in the west. That's design. And all design. You look at the clothing you're wearing. T-shirt, short, shoes. There is somebody somewhere who made your shirt. They threaded the needles. You got the bobbers ready. They brought in all the material. You had cutters. You had splicers. You had individuals doing something. I know that by faith, and I've never saw the person who made my shirt. Why? Because it's a design, and this thing didn't just happen. Somebody jumped on board and got the plastic out for the numbers. Somebody jumped on board and got the material together. Somebody got on board and set up all the all the frames and everything that needed to be set up to make this shirt what it is. Somebody got on board to sew that tag in the back. I didn't see anybody who designed this, but here's what I do know. It has a designer. And all design demands a designer. And this design that all these guys were, were looking for a miracle, and it was all around them, and they were totally missing out on who God was, who God is. And the fact that he's the great designer, and he has a design, and his design is for you not to go to hell. Your design was for you too. Your design is always to jump in what's going on in the world. And Jesus is like, I want to save you from that. As the designer, he wants to save you, not hurt you. He wants to feed you, not see you starving. He wants to heal you, not see you still broke down. And many to most ailments are caused by demonic warfare. If the demons will go, a lot of the ailments that you have, your headaches, your female problems, whatever it is, can go too. And that's what God's calling us to. We got to understand that. Because when you come to a demon, you confront that demon and you say, You must go. And then you tell that demon, I bind myself to all of my kind and infirmity. They will scream out and not want to say an infirmity. Because they want you thinking your infirmity came by way of your sickness and heredity instead of their ailments and bringing it into you. Jesus has compassion on you. Yes, there are real ailments. Yes, there are real diseases. But I'm telling you, the majority of them are satanically induced by people who are looking for something other than the designer. They're just looking for the design. Jesus says, you hypocrites, you know about the design. You've got to understand who the designer is. And Jesus, the designer, was standing right in front of him. He was the creator of all that. They loved and they acknowledged his creation, but they didn't want to acknowledge him. And in the morning it will be foul weather, they say, and, and for today. And the sky is red and lowering, you hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation is seeking after a sign. And there's going to be no sign given to it. That's where we live today. Prove to me there's a God. You show me a sign, man. There's God made something happen right now. I want to see a miracle. Dude, you woke up to a miracle. You woke up to breathing oxygen that you can't see. 
You woke up, you went to the grocery store and bought food that you didn't plant, you didn't harvest, you didn't weed, you didn't spray insecticide on it or herbicide. You went to the store and there it sat right in front of you. And you took your little fruit, your little veggie, and you exchanged it with some money. That's a miracle, man. God used other people in the field, their arms, their eyes, their sweat, their toil. And God brought it right to you, free of charge except for the one last change. The exchange from that place to my place. We're missing that place to my place. We're missing God in the mix. We're missing how God brings everything together. And we just, in our, in our America, just, oh, we're right on nothing. It just happens. It's just materializing. Ah, we just get everything and it's all the design, the design, design, design. God's calling us back to the designer that makes things happen. Where he gets the praise, he gets the glory. And he says, I'm not going to give you a sign. He says, but this, and God speaks prophecy. Jesus, remember the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, things to happen. Most of what Jesus spoke was prophetic. His own resurrection, he talked about that several times. I will rise from the dead. That hadn't happened yet, it's going to happen. And right here, he says, I'm only going to give you one sign. And that's the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of that whale, and that whale was at the lowest parts of earth, lower than... Uh, the sea land line way in the heart of the earth way in the belly of the grave so will the son of man be and he was giving a prophecy I want you to remember that I will be dead for three days and I will rise again just like Jonah rose up out of his watery grave and was regurgitated on land and he completed the work of God you're going to see earth you're going to see the grave regurgitate me up when, you, when I come up out of that grave, I'm going to have the keys of death in my hands. We're going to unlock hell, and we're going to unlock sin, and we're going to unlock everything. And I'm going to hand those keys to you, Christians, if you'll believe. You'll be able to have the Spirit of God on you, and you'll be able to do the things I've done, and only better, greater works than these that you've seen me do, you'll be able to perform. Do you have faith? That's the only sign I'm giving you. Wait for me to raise from the dead. I'm out. And he leaves. That happened. They killed him on a cross. They buried him. They put guards in front of his tomb to make sure that he wouldn't rise from the dead in three days. Three days, the stones rolled away. Boom! The glory of the angels knock all the soldiers on their backs. And out comes Jesus. And instead of believing what Jesus told them about himself being the designer and the one who would raise from the dead and the ultimate sign, they closed their eyes to that sign just like everybody in the world who's ever heard the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus has given you your sign, brother. He's risen from the dead. He's spoken it. And if you will go online, and if you are a true student, if you really do want the truth, check out the Bible codes. The Bible codes are codes within the Bible that God has hidden to verify His Bible. And on the same patch that says Jesus is God, you'll find codes that say Jesus is God. His name is Yeshua. God is the Savior. He was died, buried, resurrected, the cross. You'll find all those words in that same passage in Bible code, computer code. You see, Jesus had that code long before Satan developed his supercomputer. He developed his supercomputer off of what God has done. When he discovered that there was codes in the Scripture, he had to get to work. And he had to get technology so far advanced. He had to speak truth to them. You've got to kill your kid and I'll give you more information. You can throw your kids in the fire and I'll give you more information. And he had to get this technology so far advanced so fast after the Industrial Revolution. His whole purpose was to get these supercomputers going so they can market the beast and tr uh, track everybody like God. He can't be like God. He's one dude in one place at a time. But if he's got this computer and this visual center, he knows where everybody is at all times. He knows what's going on. He then becomes God. Jesus already had that in the Bible, buddy. And he told us that. He told us that 2,500 years ago. 2,800 years ago. I've got secret code in my scripture. It's going to prove me valid. going to prove me creative. Prove me as designer. But no, we don't want to believe that because he's not famous. He's a clown. He's archaic. He's old school. He's antiquated. <clears throat> he's God. And you better know it. He's the designer. You trust in the design. It's time to know who the designer is. Colossians 1.18 says he is the great designer. He is creator of all. And he says a wicked, wicked 
adulterous. Adulterous means wanting to bed down with every other God other than God himself. Wanting to have their own lifestyle, their lavish lifestyles. It's all about me, 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 and praise making me happy. That's adultery. Spiritual adultery. Serving self. That's Satanism. Satanism is serving self. If you... If Satan can use anything to keep you from serving the Lord Jesus Christ, you are committing adultery. Yesterday was football season. What did you love more, Jesus or your team? God knows. He's the designer. He knows what Satan is trying to do with the design. He counterfeits everything that God intended for good. Satan tries to make it bad. But Jesus Christ is going to come redeem it all and make it all good again one day real soon. That's what he's called us to. And he says a wicked generation seeks after a sign. Quit looking for signs and just say, God, I need to know who you are. Who are you? Pray that honestly. Step outside your door and say, God, I want to know the real you, the designer of all of this. He will reveal to you it's Jesus Christ. They seek after a sign. There shall be no sign given except the sign of prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. They heard it. They saw it when it happened. And they refused it. They tried to cover it up. After those soldiers were blown away backwards, they got together and said, okay, guys, we're going to get in this holy huddle here, unholy huddle, and we're going to, here's what's happened. You guys tell everybody that the disciples came and stole their bodies away at night, okay? That's going to be the story. He didn't raise from the dead. You guys weren't blown backwards. We're going to cover up the facts, and we're going to lie to people. And the Jewish people have believed that lie ever since. God's going to come around. He's going to open their eyes, and they're going to see the truth of Jesus Yeshua has been their Messiah the whole time. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Messiah. Is he your Messiah? He wants to be today. Is he your designer? He is. He wants you to know that. Jesus is God. He's given the signs. There will be no more signs. We need to believe what this book says. The designer who wrote this book is the designer who designed your life and all he's ever wanted for your life is for you to be fed, clothed, taken care of because he's good. Bad things happen to you. Come to him with those bad things. He'll make them good. But if you hold on to those bad things, how can there be a God if this bad stuff happened to me? You're looking at the design, bro of the false designer, Satan, who has counterfeited what God has intended. Come to the designer, the true designer, let him redesign your life, and that only takes place at the cross. Do you know Jesus today? Let him redesign your life.